it becomes now that we understand that animal foods are profoundly unhealthy, it becomes that much more indefensible to destroy the planet so that humans can eat animals. Once you understand that there's no health reason to eat meat, that we're not designed to eat meat, that eating meat is making us fat and sick, then all the horrors of animal agriculture begin to look like pure insanity. And nothing is more important to our health than the ability to breathe. The last seven years have been the seven warmest years on record. 2021 was also the seventh consecutive year when the global temperature has been more than one degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels, edging closer to the limit laid out in the 2015 Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Exactly how often do we have to be surprised by the headlines? In 2019, it was reported that oceans were heating 40% faster than previous estimates. And now, five years later, they are warming, quote, far exceeding anything seen in the past 40 years. If there was ever a time to follow the precautionary principle, this is it. Here's the precautionary principle, where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage. Lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. Now, you can't really say that we're not 100% sure about whether global warming is occurring when the oceans are heating up faster than even concerned climatologists had predicted. You can say, let's take a slow, measured approach to global warming. Let's take this one step at a time because we have no time. Clearly, we have to do everything we can possibly do as quickly as we can do it to restore a breathable planet. Again, lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. A steady and remarkable rise in average global temperature, global ocean temperatures this year is now outpacing anything seen in four decades of satellite observations, causing many scientists to suddenly blare alarm over the risks and realities of climate change. But even those typically aligned on climate science can't agree on what exactly triggered such rapid warming and how alarmed they should be. Some speculated that a drop in pollution allowed more sunlight to reach the oceans, but other explanations suggested a weakening of Atlantic winds carrying sun-blocking sand plumes from the Sahara, that that was a main culprit. So when you're dealing with a system involving currents, winds, volcanoes, ice covers, sand plumes, cloud formation, humidity, forest fires, we have to have the humility to acknowledge that it's a system that we can not predict with precision. Again, lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation in the history of environmental policy. Has there ever been a more cost-effective measure than eating beans instead of beef? Without federal subsidies, beef would cost 20 times more than beans and will save on so many health costs. If we must do everything we could possibly do as soon as we can possibly do it to ensure a breathable planet, and we can't predict how quickly we will pass climate tipping points if we don't, then the first step we must take is obvious. This is a no-brainer. If we want to breathe, our civilization must stop grazing animals and we must stop eating them and we must stop industrial fishing. Now, climate change is caused by the burning of fossil fuels, right? Well, in part. It's a big factor, all right. The burning of fossil fuels is indeed the second leading cause of climate change. But the leading cause is animal agriculture. And that's because of carbon opportunity cost. 37% of the world's non-ice land surface is grazed. If even less than half is restored to forests, we can sequester enough carbon dioxide to return us to pre-industrial revolution levels of atmospheric CO2. The signature greenhouse gases of an animal agriculture, methane and nitrous oxide, are far more powerful greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide. Methane is 120 times as powerful. 
Nitrous oxide is 300 times as powerful. So why isn't animal agriculture the first thing people talk about when they talk about climate change instead of the last? Well, there's the visual bias. You could see smoke smokestacks from energy plants and manufacturing plants belching carbon dioxide and other pollutants into the air. You can't see the methane and carbon dioxide being produced by 1.5 billion cattle on the planet. And then let's add in the sheep and the goats and the manure from 25 billion farmed animals, which also produces methane and nitrous oxide. Most of us don't see the lagoons of manure that are fouling our landscape. We also don't see the forests that are no longer there, that have been cut down or burned to make room for cows, and the land that has been gradually grazed into desert. In, in the year 2021, Dr. Silas Rao published in the peer-reviewed Journal of Ecological Society, a paper demonstrating that animal agriculture is responsible for at least 87% of greenhouse gases. He arrived at this figure by estimating that at least 41% of the grazing land could be restored to forest, and by estimating the carbon capture of the soil in those forests, as well as the above ground vegetation. And this estimate did not include the effects of uh, animal respiration from 25 billion farmed animals, pasture maintenance fires, bottom trawling of the oceans, and decreased sequestration from diminished phytoplankton populations due to industrial fi fishing and diminished sea forests. Now, if you include these factors, some of which are hard to measure, you find yourself estimating that animal agriculture is, is responsible for well above 100% of greenhouse gases. That is well above the amount of greenhouse gases that we're adding to the atmosphere annually. In other words, if we ended animal agriculture and rewilded the land dedicated to it, the planet would begin to cool. So when we argue for the vegan diet, we shouldn't accept the UN figure that animal agriculture is responsible for 14.5% of greenhouse gases, more than all forms of transportation. That downplays the reality many fold. Um, the UN is not factoring in carbon opportunity costs because it's just assuming that 37% of the land surface of the earth must be grazed and another 6% must be used to grow feed for animals. They're not factoring in the damage to the oceans because they're just assuming that industrial fishing must happen. They're not factoring in animal respiration because they just assume that we must have 25 billion farmed animals. So you don't have to be a climatologist to know that all their estimates are hogwash. The red dots represent in this NASA satellite map, the red dots represent the pasture maintenance fires set on just one day around the world. These fires are set to burn all vegetation that cows don't eat. Nobody is quantifying how much carbon is being released into the atmosphere from these fires. And the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is not factoring in how much vegetation and forest are lost to create grazing land. Look at the deserts. From the Sahara in northern Africa to the deserts of the Middle East to the Thar Desert in northern India to the Gobi Desert, it's a 6,000-mile stretch of mostly desert. And we know that this was all forested or was savanna in the past. The Sahara was forested less than 10,000 years ago. So what happened less than 10,000 years ago? Well, it just so happens that that's when agriculture began and humans began cutting down trees and grazing goats and cattle on the land, exacerbating other factors. Humans are clearing the Amazon now for cattle grazing and one day soon, there'll be a big patch of brown in South America called the Amazonian Desert. Animal agriculture and industrial fishing are the leading causes of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, deforestation and desertification, ocean dead zones, biodiversity loss, water scarcity, and pandemics. Is this worth all that damage for a burger? 
The bun is made from meat, from wheat. You don't need animal agriculture for the bun. You don't need it for the lettuce or the pickle or the tomato or the mustard. All you have to do is replace the beef patty with a portobello mushroom or a bean burger or soy burger or lentil burger or any kind of veggie burger. It won't taste so fatty. In fact, it'll taste better and your taste buds will quickly learn to appreciate not eating so much fat and it'll be far healthier. So let's compare social goods. The burning of fossil fuels provides transportation, heating, energy generation, the warming of homes, fuel for cooking, virtually all manufactured goods. That's a lot of social goods. I'm not an apologist for the fossil fuel industry, but you've got to admit that we've been all benefited in many ways from the burning of fossil fuels. Eating animals provides obesity, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, food poisoning, pandemics, noxious lagoons of manure, prolific waste of water and grain, and less food. We call people who raise animals for food farmers, but remember, they're actually reducing our supply of food when they feed grain and other food to the animals. So if you define a farmer as a person who grows food, they're not really farmers, are they? They're anti-farmers. In order to heal, we have to leave our wounds alone. How do we heal this planet? A doctor never dresses and bandages a wound and says, go home and scratch it every day. No, they say, leave it alone and it will heal. We are self-healing mechanisms. So is the earth. In order to heal the earth, we need to leave as much of it alone as we can. If we stop eating animals, we could leave more than 80% of the earth alone to heal. 70% of it is the oceans. We need to end industrial fishing. We also need to protect the oceans from plastics and other pollutants. But industrial fishing is what's harming the oceans far more than anything else. So we begin by protecting the oceans. If we stop eating and exploiting animals, we can add... 43% of the non-ice land surface of the earth that we can free up for rewilding, which is enough carbon capture to return us to pre-industrial age levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So once you win the health argument, and once you make the case that animal agriculture is the leading cause of climate change, the meat defenders have struck out. To summarize my advice on how to win the debate, First, be prepared for the health debate. Two, don't fall into the trap of debating health studies. Instead, analyze diet, review the macronutrients, ask where the advantage to meat could possibly lie. Three, don't fall into the trap of labeling some foods as proteins and some food as carbohydrates or allow the meat defender to do that. Four, Use logic instead of being trapped by misinformation. If humans were designed to eat meat, why are we the only mammal to experience atherosclerosis? Why do we line up with all the other herbivores in every respect of anatomy and function? Why do we have no claws and such unimpressive teeth that we call canines? Why do we have no desire to bite into the living flesh of animals? Why does only the low-fat vegan diet reverse heart disease? Why would we want to cycle our nutrients through animals instead of getting them directly through plants? What is there in meat that could possibly be good for you and worth destroying the planet for? The answer, of course, is nothing. Now, repeatedly through this talk, I've used the phrase, it just so happens that. Let me read back some instances from this presentation when I use that phrase. It just so happens that dietary fiber is crucial to creating metabolites that improve our health and even metabolites that can improve our mood. It just so happens that metabolites from meat consumption are dangerous. It just so happens that we're the only species to get atherosclerosis. It just so happens that when you feed cholesterol to omnivores and carnivores, such as dogs and cats, atherosclerosis never develops. Dr. Campbell's work proved that it just so happens that while animal protein brought on cancer, plant protein did not. 
It just so happens that diets with large amounts of saturated fat, animal products, and refined carbohydrate may induce endotoxemia more markedly than diets containing fiber-rich plant foods. The Sahara was forested less than 10,000 years ago. So what happened less than 10,000 years ago? It just so happens that's when agriculture began and humans began cutting down trees and grazing goats and cattle on the land. 